The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, I apologize again for those who joined last time round um, for our technical difficulties, but I'm glad you can join us uh, again today. Um, today's webinar is uh, from the Employer Brand Academy is on the uh, the subject of positioning and differentiation. So before I start, I just wanted to say a few words about the uh, Academy. Um, so this is a, a course uh, that's been uh, run now for, for the last uh, 12 months. We're now on our uh, third round of, of the course. Uh, the Employer Brand Academy was uh, set up in conjunction with Universum, but is a, an independent body. And essentially, the purpose of the Employer Brand course is to provide a firm foundation in all of the, uh, the basics, all the fundamentals you need to, to really run uh, an effective employer brand strategy and employer brand management strategy. So we have uh, two different types of course. The, the main course involves uh, an online element. There are webinars and uh, a couple of in-person meetings. There's a kickoff meeting at the front end, and then there's a certification day at the back end. Um, you can see the, uh, the dates for the kickoff there on the left-hand side and the locations, and you can see the also the, uh, the dates for, for, for the final certification on the right hand side coming up soon. So if you haven't uh, take, taken a look at it, please take a look at the site. Um, I would uh, you know, recommend it to, to you, of course, um, closely involved in running a number of these events. But we've had we've had very good feedback to date. And um, if you're interested in learning more about employer brand management, I think it's uh, as I say, I think it provides a very good foundation. So in addition to the face-to-face uh, -face workshops or the, the international version, which is in English, we also now have a, a purely online version, which is um, available in seven languages. So all the main languages, uh, French, German, Russian, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, so again, if uh, you're feeling as though um, you can't uh, necessarily attend the on uh, the uh, the face-to-face -face course and are less comfortable in English, then there, there is also a uh, uh, there is also another online option with um, local languages. So uh, moving on to the, the main program. Um, so brand positioning. And uh, this is one of those phrases that's pretty familiar to those in marketing, less familiar to those in HR, and probably also less familiar to those in conventional recruitment marketing. But he, here's a definition from Kevin Lane Keller, he's a, a well-renowned authority in consumer brand management, has written a number of uh, great books. Um, if you're interested in exploring the wider background uh, of brand management, then highly recommend strategic brand management. It's a bit of a hefty tome, but really very, very useful indeed. And he uh, describes uh, positioning, uh, I think, in a very straightforward way as the act of designing the company's offering and image to occupy a distinctive place in the minds of the target market. So essentially, it's working off the basis your, your employer brand is something that exists in, in the minds and hopefully the hearts of your you know, potential candidates, your target audiences. And this is all about making sure that they are that you are building the right associations with them. So it aligns with you know, what you're offering as an employer. But also beyond that, it's also occupying a distinctive place and this is this is pretty important as I hope to, to demonstrate because I think um, in in consumer markets you you tend to have a pretty wide field field of competitors um, but usually it runs into the you know tens maximum 20s uh, in terms of different com competing brands of, of course in the employer brand space when you're you're competing for talent actually then it's going to be potentially hundreds of different companies that you're competing with in a, in a given uh, location uh, a given country and if you're a multinational well you know it, it can be extremely diverse in terms of you know potential competition so uh, turning to consumer uh, marketing, because I think this is perhaps an easier place to to start. Because I think, in some respects, we're all we're all marketeers, or we all understand marketing from the point of view of of consumers. And um, point here is, uh, if you take something like the drinks market, 
if you think about the options available to you and the years of marketing that have gone into a number of these products, you can generally see actually pretty clear positioning for a number of, of, of the leading brands. Now, th these brands are going to vary from market to market. You'll probably be familiar with Red Bull and Coca-Cola, perhaps a little less familiar with Innocent and Tango. They're a little uh, more um, local, regional. But um, suffice to say that all of these brands have... Um, developed the, the, the firm foundations of good branding around, you know, product consistency and quality, etc. And that's a very important part of branding. But they've also put a great deal of, a deal of effort into differentiation. So if you're if you're thinking about your drinks choices as you work into walk into a store, um, if you're looking for uplift, feeling a bit tired, then Red Bull is probably a great option. Um, if you're looking for a taste, tangos, they talk about their taste sensation as, as the packaging uh, gives you a firm indication of, you know, that's the main positioning for tango. Um, if, if your body is your temple uh, and you're looking for refreshment, but also uh, health con conscious and a product like Innocent, pure fu fruit smoothies, uh, no additives, uh, I understand very good for you. And uh, if you're um, looking for a, 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 a more straightforward choice in some respects. And this is interesting because with Coca-Cola, um, you get a typical strategy from a leading brand within an overall market. Um, so within the drinks re refreshment space or the non-alcoholic uh, drink space, Coca-Cola is still, of course, very dominant. Then actually their positioning is in some respects rather more uh, emotive. It's 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 about happiness. Um, it's about togetherness. Um, their core line, open happiness, um, is 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 pretty broad, but also deeply rooted in in their advertising over the course of many many years. And and that happiness generally also rooted in the core concept of togetherness, sociability. Um, it's. Uh, a very old advert now, but a very famous one, teaching the world to sing was one of their famous ads going back 40, 50 years. And, and actually, they've they've kept their positioning pretty close to that whole idea of um, togetherness and happiness and sociability over the course of many, many years. So you can you can understand here, you know, that there is in some respects a, a, a map that you could draw of the different uh, types of drinks available to you and a, a clear positioning for a number of these leading brands occupying different parts of that map. Now, the, it's true also if if you look at certain markets and I say certain uh, markets because it does vary according to how much clear positioning there is in, in certain industri industry sectors compared with others. And, and, and you might expect uh, the leading players in terms of clear positioning would be in the consumer goods sector. And, and that would be right, because over the course of time, I would say that the um, consumer goods or fast moving consumer goods sector has actually been pretty pioneering generally in terms of employer brand practice and, and in terms of, of positioning, that, that's, that's certainly true. So this is going back now uh, four or five years, but I thought it was a you know, particularly interesting and clear example of positioning. So we have uh, four of the leading consumer goods companies here, PepsiCo, P&G, um, Unilever and L'Oreal. And hopefully you can see from this again, looking at the advertising, looking at the core positioning for, for each one, um, you can see that there is a, a, a clear differentiation. So PepsiCo talks very much about uh, potential, both learning, career development, um, and uses the tagline possibilities. And this was on the understanding when they went into their, this, this positioning uh, a number of years ago, that people don't always understand the fact that PepsiCo is a very large company indeed. Um, I think now close to 250,000 people, very international and also has a very broad portfolio. So it offers a, a really wide range of different brands for, for marketers to work on, not just Pepsi. Um, it includes Frito-Lay and Tropicana and a whole range of other um, uh, goods as well. Quaker Oats, in some respects, quite quite surprising, a quite surprisingly diverse uh, portfolio. So there's huge potential there, both you know for working on different brands, but also uh, working internationally with PepsiCo. Um, with Unilever, long history of social purpose, um, and this came very much to the fore in their positioning around um, For Want of a Better World, and for a period of time, that 
core purpose of the organization was was very fundamental to their employer branding. Um, you can see bottom right, L'Oreal talking really about bef- the performance of the business. Um, I think, you know, generally people have a, a, a view of L'Oreal as, as being, of course, driven by, um, you know, marketing, great advertising, um, and obviously, you know, cosmetics and so on, quite attractive uh, to, to, to many people in the comms and marketing space. But actually, they recognize that one of the uh, areas they were weaker was people really understanding how performance driven, how business oriented they are. So here you can see through more business, more ambition, more global, more passion, just how focused they are on performance. And for Procter & Gamble, uh, much more focused on on the people within the business. So the famous line they've used for, for, for years within their camp- campaign advertising, we hire the person, not the position, is really counter to some of the preconceptions of, of P&G as being somewhat process oriented, um, you know, more, more focused on on the operations and necessarily the, the, the people within the business, but actually not true at all. Very, very people uh, oriented business and full of great characters. Uh, and they look for character in people. They look for people who uh, are really uh, thriving on challenges, you know, uh, enjoy, you know, working with others. And uh, that whole campaign was was really uh, and positioning was was based on the people within the organization. So here you can see, you know, four, four different positioning areas. I think if we take a step back um, from the work that um, Universum have done over over many years, and also the the work I, I put into my, my my latest book in terms of really thinking about the the hundreds, uh, literally over a hundred um, EVPs that um, have been involved in, in in some form or other over the last ten years. We would say actually, if you if you take a step back, there are around you know nine key positioning territories. So we saw we saw four of them. Uh, purpose, people, potential, um, which covers two areas, and uh, and if you if you then kind of draw back a little bit, you can see actually um, quite a lot of positioning around the purpose of companies. A lot of a lot of those you know focusing uh, and aligning on the corporate mission of the company. Um, quite a, a few around teamwork that also covers things like um, you know the diversity within the business the nature of the people within the business, the character of the people within the business, um, empowerment, very, you know, very strong in some organizations, um, you know, particularly those businesses whose, whose very uh, nature is, is about empowerment, often through technology, um, innovation, learning, which you can split out some companies very focused on, on being um, learning organizations, uh, career potential, performance, um, status, Often companies will talk about their size or their international um, uh, scope, etc., and reward. Um, not necessarily the most uh, frequently used as a core positioning, but or, or clearly fundamental to to the employment deal. So I think um, you know if you if you think about your own positioning, if you think about the competitors in your market or your key competitors, I think you'll probably find you're able to slot them in. Um, either in terms of the one big thing that they, they tend to talk about, it could be their core tagline if they have one, or the main thing that appears on their career homepage, or if you think about the range of different things that they tend to talk about when they are describing you know, reasons to work at the company, they tend to fall into these, these different areas. And I think it's interesting, but I'd like to you know, draw a parallel um, actually with, with storytelling, um, because there's some very interesting work that's been done on the structure of uh, plots, uh, the different types of story and story structures. A very interesting book. I should be getting um, royalties for this because I've been promoting it quite heavily over the last six months. But a book called The Seven Basic Plots, which very interestingly claims and demonstrates that if you think of all of the books you've ever read, the films you've seen, the plays you've been to, they tend to resolve back to seven basic plot structures. Um, so there are a number of ones that are quite famous, tragedy, comedy, but there's also The Quest, Rags to Riches, Rebirth. I mean, the, there are a number of, of plot lines that, you know, despite different characterization, different context, you'll, you'll get the same basic narrative structure appearing time and time again. And actually, I, what I'd like to, 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 to do is demonstrate that there are some parallels between that plot structure and actually the way people 
um, talk about careers. But ju just to start off, just to demonstrate in some respects a bit of fun, um, I just want to give you some idea about what we mean by the underlying plot structure. I think it's important to understand this first before making the parallel with um, employment branding. But for, for those of you who've, who've seen the internship, um, and I hope a number of you have seen it, and if you haven't, you should take a look because it does focus on, on the number one most a, a attractive employer, certainly to students and graduates around the world for many years now, Google. Um, it's a kind of intri interesting insight into what it's like on the inside of Google. I think they did participate in the film. They did sign it off. Um, but it's essentially about the story of, of, of two friends, Billy and Nick. Uh, you know, their lives are, are, are somewhat uh, disrupted. Their, their role as watch salesman is completely destroyed by the rising power of digital commerce. So essentially everything's going online. They were door to door. You know, that was just completely destroyed. Um, so with this a necessary call to action, they, they set out on this journey, really, through through the world of Google. They get an internship, and there they make new friends. They they do battle, you know, quite literally with this uh, quite range of strange new beings that they come across, these tech-savvy geniuses, quite different from the world of watch salesmen that they come across at Google. Um, and through this process, they learn, they adapt, you know, they, they try out new ideas and ultimately they succeed in overcoming this, this force or at least getting to grips with it, this whole area of digital commerce. Um, they previously thought that it was an insurmountable threat. They, they overcome it and, and they achieve the final reward, which is getting full time jobs at Google. So, you know, fairly typical plot structure. But uh, just to draw the parallel, it's almost exactly the same as one of the main plots within Lord of the Rings. So if you think of uh, Frodo and Sam, who lives their cont contented lives in Hobbiton, um, this, this is all brought to an end by the rising power of Mordor. So not digital commerce, but something rather more evil than that, Mordor. They set out on a journey through the strange new worlds. They find fellowship along the way. They do battles uh, with uh, goblins, trolls, and orcs. They learn, they adapt, they put new ideas to the test, and ultimately they succeed in overcoming this force that had previously appeared insurmountable. Um, so, you know, you can understand, even though very different context, very different film, if you watch the two films, you're probably not aware of the underlying structure, but, the you know, the, the, the structure is there. And... You know, what I'd argue is, is that actually, in some respects, when you're talking about employer branding, there, there are many parallels with adventure because essentially, you know, this, this plot um, line is almost the uber plot line. It's the adventure plot line and the journey plot line. And, and this is actually quite similar to, to the way you might think about um, uh, your uh, you know, employer brand uh, offer, you, you know, the careers you're offering, because essentially I would argue that the, the key elements that make stories engaging, you know, the ones I've discussed, higher purpose, forging friendships, taking on challenges, you know, finding solutions, uh, you know, learning from that experience, making progress, achieving your goals, achieving status and reward. The, these are actually the same elements that, that really make work engaging as well. So I think, um, it's interesting to have this in the back of your mind because increasingly now when you're thinking about propositions, um, that gives you the, the, the key elements that you're offering to people. But of course, storytelling has become so central to the way that you, you talk about your employer brand and you, you market your employer brand that having this in the back of your mind, this narrative, this core narrative, and particularly the elements within that narrative that make for engaging communication, but also engaging work, I think is, is quite important. So what I'm going to come back now to, though, is, is differentiation. If this gives you some idea of the overall positioning areas, I, I just want to touch on, uh, and give some illustrations of five of the, the most typical positioning areas and, and, and the work we've done recently um, uh, in terms of a global best practice survey um, which will be published within the next four or five weeks. It's going to make for some great reading. We've got close to 2,000 companies who've been involved in this, and including, um, which is very exciting for, for, for us at Universum, 90% of the companies who we list as the world's most attractive employers. So the, these are the, the companies 
who around the 12 major economies of the world have the highest rankings among students, graduates, young professionals. They are, you know, the, the most highly ranked employers. So we've got 90 percent of those who've shared with us um, their employer brand practice. And one of the things they've shared with us is also their positioning, their, the, the key elements of their EVPs. So um, the, the main ones, as I said, from that research have been purpose, teamwork, empowerment, innovation, and career. I just want to give you a little feel for each one. And then I also want to talk a little bit about the tendency towards certain sectors um, to position themselves in a very similar way. So let's, let's start with the illustration. So first of all, purpose. And certain sectors, um, pharmaceutical industry being one of them, are very vocational, very, very driven by um, what the companies do to help people. Um, and in, the, in this case, Lily Careers, it's about improving lives around the world. Very, very clear purpose positioning. And um, I'm, I'm sure you'd recognize that, you know, particularly if, if, if you're uh, you've, you've, you've set out with a, you know, a vocation in, in science or medicine, you know, this is very attractive. Um, this one for teamwork, uh, together at Airbnb, um, one, of, one of those startup companies from 10 years or so ago that has been very, very successful. And actually, if you look at the startup sector, small and large, this, this whole aspect of togetherness, sociability, um, showing it, as you can see here, almost as an extension of, of what it might have felt like at a very cool, I would have to say, university or college, um, hanging out with your friends, um, working in a very flexible way is, is also a very um, prominent positioning and also a very attractive one, again, particularly at the younger end of the scale. Um, empowerment. This is one of those which tends to now crop up also quite a lot in the tech sector. So um, Microsoft being one of the most prominent examples of this, Empower Your Future is on the front page of their career site, and it, it's run through their employee value proposition for, for, I would say, at least 10 or 15 years now, having kept a pretty close eye on them. You, you might also remember their line, um, Come as you are, do what you love, which is, again, very much about empowering people to be themselves, um, encouraging individuality and really saying, look, if you come here, we will offer the flexibility for you to do what you really love. Find your strengths, put those into practice, etc. cetera. Um, innovation, um, again, very popular. Again, tech sector, of course, uh, have, have a, a, a lot of um, positionings around innovation. But also when you think about engineering and if you think about the, 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 bo the, the broader kind of bigger engineering companies, um, then typically they will talk very much about um, innovation in terms of challenges. That's one of their one of their big things. Uh, crops up also interestingly with PNG innovation core, core uh, of core importance to, to PNG, but but even more fundamentally um, played out uh, across uh, a number of the uh, the big uh, oil companies, big engineering companies, and you can see here from Chevron. Um, Chevron engineers and scientists apply their talents to some of the most challenging projects on the planet. They talk a lot about, you know, putting yourself to work to, to really come up with these great innovative solutions to, to, to big challenges. And, and finally, career. Um, I think, you know, career advancement, very, very central, of course, to what people are looking for. If you look at any of the work around attraction drivers, um, then obviously people want to join a company, yes, get a good job, but they also want that wider scope of opportunity. What's happening next? How am I going to progress? And a very common positioning um, is uh, around the kind of global opportunities that are offered. A lot of students now have that you know, global mindset. They're not just thinking about working in their home country, but where else they may potentially work. And world of opportunities is, is one of those classic positionings in the career area where you're talking about, um, you know, not, not just the, 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 op the immediate opportunities, but this great scope for opportunity across uh, the company, particularly if it's a multinational. So um, what, I've, but what I want to you know, point out is, you know, all of these are very attractive positionings. They fit within their markets. Um, they, they fit typically the main attraction drivers of their target profiles. 
But there's, there's, there's a watch out here because I think the tendency quite often is, is for companies to look at the research and then come up with very similar answers. So I'm going to go back through three of these just to demonstrate that. So the first one, um, in terms of the pharma industry, you saw Lily careers improving lives around the world. Well, actually, it's very similar to, to many others. And I've, I've picked three here because the, the wording is very, very similar. So Roche, um, make your mark, improve lives. Um, Merck, uh, committed to saving and improving lives. Uh, Novartis, again, very focused on their overall mission, discover new ways to extend and improve people's lives. So you can see that if, you're, if you were looking around these sites, it's fine, they, they'd all be attractive to you. This does align with what people are looking for when they're looking at uh, careers in, in the pharma industry. But, but again, uh, this gives you kind of trust and reliability that you found you know, potentially the right career, but not necessarily giving you as much guidance on, on finding the right company. So not really um, much differentiation around the core employer brand claims. Um, so coming back to, to World of Opportunities, and um, this is reflecting some of the front page career site images um, from the last five years within the financial services sector. And um, I, I offer a few here. In fact, there are many more uh, who, who have used this, this same line. So World of Opportunities, again, you know, fits with what people are looking for from working for a global multinational bank. Um, but again, you can see here exactly the same term or exactly the same phrase used on, on the front page career site of HSBC, of Citibank, of UBS, which is the top one, and Bank of America. Now, I have to say these are not currently all together all being displayed, but I'm just saying there's this tendency over time. These are from the last um, four or five years for, for, for companies to come back to some of these almost kind of default positionings, which... Um, uh, as I say, fit fit with attraction drivers, but don't necessarily um, provide that much differentiation when you begin to look around the, the rest of the industry. So the other side of this is also the visual positioning. And, and um, I've, I've, I've shown this uh, a number of times in a number of different formats uh, over the course of the last few years. And, and it's still, I have to say, pretty prominent. Um, some of those, these now are, are, are not current. Some of them are current. You can have a look around the different sites if you like, have a bit of fun looking around the career sites of the global um, banks and, and see which ones are current and which ones are not. Um, but you'll see time and time again the rule of four. And the rule of four is essentially, typically on the front page of career sites, is where you're, you're, you're showing diversity. Obviously, that's the key message. You know, you're, div you're diverse, you're inclusive but you're showing it in a very, very similar way because you know, the archetypal approach to this is four people, two men, two women, or in a range of different ethnic backgrounds. I mean, you, you can see it right in front of you. I don't have to explain that much more. You know, the point is, is that this, this um, you know, does the job. I mean, it does the job in terms of saying we're diverse and inclusive. And again, but it is this other job of, of this unique positioning or at least differentiated positioning that just pushes it that much further and says, OK, yeah, I understand they're diverse and inclusive, but, but I also understand a little bit more about how they're different from, from the other companies. So a number of steps. So um, if, if you're thinking about how to work with this, I would say, um, step number one is is mapping your competition. So if if you can you can either use in some respects the the, the center of this if you're thinking about the, the the core positioning areas, purpose, teamwork, innovation, and so on. Um, this is some of the research that's 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 coming out of our global employer brand practice survey from a thousand employers worldwide. You can see in the central dial here um, the proportion of companies who's who's who are using. Um, a, a core positioning around some of these key elements. Um, as, you, as I said, you can see that purpose, teamwork, empowerment, innovation, uh, pretty strong. Um, and, uh, you know, learning career, the, the, the next ones that are strong. Um, but, and then down, down the, the, the left and right hand sides here, this is some, you know, additional research that Universum uses on a regular basis. These are our um, global attraction drivers and we, we use this right across all of our surveys internationally. And it also gives you some indication of some of the other um, positioning areas within those broad territories. So if you're talking about uh, teamwork, it could be respect, it could be um, friendliness, it could be the team orientation of the environment, it could be 
diversity and inclusion, it could be international interaction, it gives you some idea of, again, the frequency with which, you know, some of these different things are used. Um, the second area, once you've, you know, mapped out your competition, you've got some idea of where you are, where they are, where, where most people in the industry tend to be going, is to find your own space within that territory. So if you're if you're in an industry, for example, where most people are talking about innovation, that's quite central to it. So particularly, as I say, in the, the tech sector, in the engineering sectors, um, it, it, actually pretty much any of the sectors which strongly rely on STEM or IT talent, innovation is a core cool thing. Then what you need to do is, is say, OK, if our what is innovation, you know, that's what we're talking about. What we need to focus on is the how, how, how we deliver it, what's, what's particular to um, our culture, what's particular to our way of doing things that makes us different. And I provided some examples here of companies who, who all stress um, innovation as being at the heart of their proposition, but actually talk about it in different ways. So Imagineering, a fa fairly famous phrase from Walt Disney, that combination of, of um, you know, high, high tech and also kind of blue sky um, imagination and magic, another great word that they use quite often. Um, you know, coming together to 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 create create great movies and and great uh, entertaining content. Um, Facebook, if you don't recognise that one, talk about moving fast and breaking things. Very high frequency um, approach to innovation. Uh, try lots of things out. It's not a long planning period where they you know plan everything to the nth degree and then launch something. They're constantly trying things seeing if they work, if they don't work, they move on. If they do work, um, you know, they, they stick with it. Um, and if also importantly, if things don't work, they learn the lessons and they improve and they move forward. So that's uh, very important. IKEA talk about democratic design. It's one of their key phrases. And um, if you're aware of IKEA, of course, you'd be aware that they're very creative, very innovative, but within a tight budget. It's very, very practical company, very resourceful, not big spend, but, you know, it's, it's all about how you how you uh, achieve innovation, um, but within very tight bounds in terms of cost and budget and so on. And and the final one here, Agile Minds Don't Think Alike, um, this is the financial sector, this is Deutsche Bank. Um, so again, you know, you know, interesting that they're they're focusing on innovation, but their their way of thinking about it is how people think, and they're talking about mental agility and and in some respects trying to own that within the area of financial services. So final one then, coming back to our favourite rule of four, is then thinking about how you present yourselves, and I think um, I think this is <laughs> obviously a fair a fair demonstration of how um, there, there can be a tendency for visually presenting in a similar way. Well, again, coming back to my favourite here, this is Deutsche Bank again. Um, they're also talking a, a lot about uh, diversity, um, but they're presenting it in a very different way. They're presenting it more metaphorically. Um, I love this. Uh, it's no no longer there on their main career site, but I thought it was a perfect example of thinking about diversity in a somewhat more diverse way, should we say, than than many others in the industry. Uh, and they're showing a range of different color paint pots. I mean, very very different, but I mean, it says to you that you know that they they have got a, an agile and diverse way of 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 thinking. So um, so those are, as I say, three three key tips. Um, uh, Think about your overall positioning currently. Think about your competitors. And in addition, the, the really main point here is, is just being a little bit more aware of the territory you're occupying versus your competitors. So it's not just about getting your value proposition um, so it's attractive to your key target audience and true to the organization. It's also thinking about your relative positioning to others. And hopefully I've provided you with a, a few tips on, on how to go, think about that and how to uh, tackle it uh, moving forwards. So that's, uh, that's it for me. Um, I um, would like to uh, you know, pick up any, any questions uh, that you might have. Um, so if, if you'd like to type in your questions, I'd be very happy to answer them um, and uh, if uh, you don't have questions now you can also find me on LinkedIn I'm pretty easy to find so if you can't if you don't have any immediate questions but uh, a question occurs to you somewhat later on then please feel free to get in touch uh, very happy to link in with you and very happy to answer any further questions uh, that you might have 
Um, so it doesn't look like we've got any questions uh, for the moment, if I'm, I'm correct. Um, hopefully, though, you found that useful. And yeah, and oh, no, nope, here we are. We have one question. So how do you find out how we position in relation to others in the industry? Now, um, the great thing about, of course, the, 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 the new world of a digital, digital recruitment advertising is that um, much of it is is visible and, and open and, and reasonably transparent, or at least it should be. So if people, are, if actually, if your competitors are doing a reasonably good job around their employer brand, if you go to their career site, um, first thing to look at is their homepage. What is the first and most obvious thing on their career homepage um, that is saying? If, if you're not clear, it just means they don't have a clear positioning. So that's an easy one. So they probably have a fairly generic and, and kind of composite positioning of a whole load of different things. So that's the first place to look. That should be the core positioning. You might even also put the name of the company in and then just put recruitment advertising and look in Google Image or whatever your local search engine is and see um, what you come up with because often then it will throw up um, any recruitment advertising that they may be using. And again, for that, look at the core tagline. Again, what's it talking to you about? Is it purpose? Is it teamwork? Is it development? Is it career? You know, again, what's the positioning? Then if you want to go a step below that, on most career sites now, again, well-constructed career sites, you tend to have the question, why join, or some version of that. And typically within that, you'll tend to find then the other component parts of the value proposition. So they may have a core positioning, the one core thing they want to be known for, um, they may then have some other further elements, which are secondary elements that you'll find um, within that why join section. So again, are they talking about development? Are they talking about innovation? What are they talking about? Um, and that would give you some idea of their core positioning, main positioning, and then some of the secondary positioning. And and I would advise, you know, what you do is you list out your core competitors, you write down on the left-hand side, you put it in a spreadsheet if you like, on the left-hand side, you write down the different positioning areas, and then you go through and you certainly, for each competitor, identify uh, the core positioning, if they have one, uh, and then a secondary positioning, um, which is um, then your way of kind of mapping out how you go about this. So, should our EVP be our inspiration? Um, right, okay. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, the, thing, the thing about value propositions is that they're, 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 they come in different shapes and sizes, and I wouldn't necessarily say that there is an ideal way of approaching it. The, the, the most important thing about thinking about an EVP, like any strategy, it's largely about focus. So the reason you put a value proposition um, together, apart from hopefully describing your employment offer in a compelling way, is to be clear about the areas or, or the three or four typical key things that you are focusing your communication on because you need to focus typically to get your message across to, to, to different audiences. Um, if you're talking about a whole load of things, they're never really going to work out what's the most important thing to you. If you talk about three or four things, then you'll you'll begin to get some associations uh, with yourselves because these are the themes that you're talking about time and time again. The other important element of that is not just your communication themes, but also what you're focusing on from an HR point of view. So if, if you're saying, for example, that career development is, is really important to you, you're talking about it a lot, it's also got to be underpinned by your HR strategy. So do you have you know, a, a clear career pathing, are you providing people with uh, good guidance in terms of their development, performance and development appraisals around their careers, et cetera, et cetera? You know, how are you underpinning those things and where are you spending your, your people management uh, budget and, and investment? So I would say, you know, you, you, you should really think about your EVP in terms of, first of all, that focus on a number of key elements and then um, over and above that, that tends to give you your four or five, you know, often, as I've been talking about it, kind of secondary positioning areas, your deal. And then um, the core positioning, the one thing you most want to be famous for, tends to be in some respects more of a communication driver. So you have to choose generally um, if you're, if you're going to get your message across to be reasonably single-minded, particularly if you're trying to get some 
uh, consistency across your your uh, different digital domains. So if if you're thinking about your career site, what goes on the home page? If you're thinking about prof profile pages in your social media, in the social media, what are, you know, what are the prominent things that you're you're putting forward? So it's that kind of thing which tends to be driving your 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 value proposition. The final thing um, in terms of uh, in some respects, current reality versus aspiration, I, I figure that may also be part of this question, is you've got to try and generally get a mix of some things that are absolutely true today. These are your trust builders. These are the things that people can look at within the proposition and say, yes, I recognize that. I'm proud of that. That's how we really are. And then some other areas which are you know, natural to any company, more aspirational. So the areas in which you're improving. The, the, the important thing is that we're talking about aspirations, not wishful thinking. So if you do put aspirations into your value proposition, so these are things, these are areas where you're making forward progress on, you really have to make sure that they're underpinned with leadership commitment and tangible actions. So um, if you're going to put them in there, that's great. It gives you some forward momentum. It gives the brand some vitality. But you've got to make sure that they're credible. Otherwise, you're just going to drive disengagement. If people arrive and they find that you've been talking about something, it, whether it's an aspiration or not, but there's no evidence of it actually um, improving, then they are actually going to feel like they've been, um, well, at the worst, lied to. But generally, they're, they're going to feel rather disengaged because... They've, they've come in expecting one thing, they've been made a promise, but that promise is not being delivered. So hopefully that gives you a, a, a kind of broader view on, on, on putting together value propositions and how that fits with positioning. So um, looks like those are all the questions for now. I um, hope you enjoyed the uh, presentation. I hope the, also the uh, questions and answers were, were useful to you. Um, Please enjoy the rest of your day or the rest of your afternoon or the rest of your evening, depending on where you are. And we look forward to speaking to you again uh, in, the, in the near future as uh, we will be also uh, continuing the program of webinars uh, over the course of, of the rest of the year. So, again, thanks very much for joining. And, oh, we have one more question. Uh, right, okay, let me just pick this one up before I go. I'm showing my own flexibility here. Um, question is, often the core positioning message, message focuses on the long term, um, which can be unrealistic. Um, will you foresee short term one is feasible? Um, again, you've, you've just got to weigh this up. I think if anything is unrealistic, then it should not really be in the positioning message or the value proposition. So, you know, it's important, of course, that you find something that's attractive to people. But if you take the broader view of things, it's no point attracting people then to disengage them once they've arrived. You know, the fastest way to kill any, uh, to kill a poor product <laughs> is to advertise it. Or the, the fastest way to, to kill any product is to uh, miscommunicate, you know, what it's going to do. So um, essentially, you do need to be careful. So if if there's a, a trade-off between a long-term goal, which is somewhat unrealistic or over-aspirational, I wouldn't go for that. I would rather you went for more of a short-term goal. It may not be as exciting to people or as attractive, but if it's realistic and it's credible in the longer term, it will work for you much better and build a stronger employer brand. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, yes, as I say, have a lovely day and hope to also um, hear from you again soon. Thanks very much.